Hello and welcome to a special discussion program in celebration of St. Lucia's 42nd anniversary of independence. Our discussion today is on sustainable economic development, a resilient nation. We can, we will. The COVID-19 pandemic has tested our resolve as a St. Lucian people to persevere against the adversity brought about by this pandemic, which has simultaneously impacted the region and the entire world. St. Lucia, like the rest of the world, faces an unprecedented health and economic crisis, both of which have, crippling, have had crippling effects on the nation's resources, as government, the private sector, NGOs, and individuals were thrusted into survival mode to combat the literal blows brought about by this pandemic. Every aspect of our economy has been adversely affected. Education, banking, commerce, industry, health and wellness, agriculture, transportation, tourism, and the list goes on. But as a resilient people, a resilient nation, we, need, we did not bury our heads in the sand. We have had to swallow bitter pills, make sacrifices, and take tough decisions to prevent the total collapse of our economy. Here in studio today, we have an esteemed panel of experts who will tell us more about how St. Lucia has done, how we have persevered against the COVID-19 um, pandemic, and what are we currently doing. So we have in the middle our lone lady in studio, Ms. Esther Rigobert, and she is the PS in the Department of Finance and the Director of Finance. To her, to my right, is Mr. Tommy Deska, Chief Economist, Department of Economic Development. Mr. Benson Emil, the PS in the Department of Health and Wellness. And we have our two Zoom um, participants, or so participants via Zoom, Mr. Jonathan Allen. He is the Commerce and Industry, uh, Commerce and Industry Officer. And Mr. Vincent Boland, the man who has all the money so far in this room. And he is the Managing Director for the St. Lucia Development Bank. And they will be discussing with us um, this very important topic of sustainable economic development. So before we start, I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves by just telling us your portfolio, a little more about your portfolio. And I want you to tell us one wish you have for St. Lucia. And after all, it's our independence. One wish for St. Lucia post-COVID-19. And um, we start with the, the lone lady in the mix. It's not often we have a lone lady in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasant day to all St. Lucia, and I want to wish everyone happy Independence 42. It's a pleasure to be here. Glenn would have introduced me, um, PS Finance and also Director of Finance. That's, um, well, essentially two portfolios in one. Um, I have the responsibility to run the Department of Finance, which is part of the Ministry of Finance, and work closely with the Minister of Finance, Incidentally, in our, in our case, that would be the Prime Minister and the Cabinet of Ministers to execute a range of initiatives, one being um, the formulation of policy for economic development and resilience building. Um, I also am responsible for approximately 10 different departments within the government service. And that ranges from Customs and Excise, Inland Revenue Department, Accountant General Department, Postal services, debt and investment within the section called financial management and administration. I'm also responsible for budget the budget office, research and policy, administration at the finance department. And the list is so long that I think <laughs> I may have missed out one or two. But essentially, I'm responsible for the management and administration of all matters relating to finance as it relates to the government and to ensure that each of those departments under my care deliver their independent individual mandate to the best of their ability. As Director of Finance, I'm responsible for providing oversight to the financial framework within St. Lucia, both from a regulatory standpoint, legislative and administrative. S and um, several pieces of legislation refers to the Director of Finance, um, being the government's representative on various boards and authorities, hence that's a big portfolio consuming maybe more than half of my time. But in a nutshell, Glenn, that would be a synopsis of what I'm responsible for. Wow. I thought I wanted your job. I don't want your job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us, you know, post-COVID-19, 
what is your wish for St. Lucia? I think we want to be optimistic before we actually delve into the situation at hand. Thank you, Glenn. Um, my one wish for St. Lucia is that we believe in ourselves, believe in the possibilities. There's a saying that says, a saying, um, do not waste a crisis. Because every crisis comes with both opportunities and challenges. So it's necessary that whilst we manage the difficulties and the challenges, we look for the opportunities um, amidst the difficulties and do not waste the crisis. So my one wish is that we believe in ourselves as a people. We are a very resilient nation. I mean, history speaks volumes of what we can do when we put our heads and shoulders together. So if that amounts to anything, that's my one wish for St. Lucia. Wow, I love that. Do not waste a crisis. I think that's, that's profound. So we have the other PS in the room. And uh, Mr. Gentleman, I haven't had much interaction with, but he's in a ministry that I really love, health and wellness. <laughs> um, Mr. Benson Emil, tell us about your portfolio and your one wish for St. Lucia post-COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, all St. Lucians, on the eve of our 42nd independence anniversary. Um, also, good afternoon to colleague panelists, those here and those, you know, attending virtually. Um, well, as has introduced, I'm the acting permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Um, right now, the emphasis is it's COVID, so it's more or less the COVID ministry. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. But just to add, well, we have, uh, as a permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health, I'm responsible for the management and administration of public health. Uh, and that includes, you know, all the health facilities that we have around the island, you know, administering health care. It includes environmental health. Um, it includes the office of the chief medical officer who has, you know, quite a bit of jurisdiction over the, the regulation, you know, of, our, of, of the health sector in St. Lucia. Um, generally, you know, as a, as a government, we still participate, you know, in the delivery of health care through our facilities, you know, and both primary and secondary so there is a bit of you know oversight over the delivery of healthcare as well so you have a lot on your shoulders you have the entire covid strategy on your shoulders <laughs> and and you knew in the ministry as well relatively new yes i am i've yeah. been there roughly around six months six months so, so i'm forced to, to learn quickly. by fire forced to learn quickly <laughs> well i told ps at another forum she was baptized in covid when she got <laughs> the season so tell us your one wish for st lucia post covid 19. um we're going through quite a tremendous experience now and there are lessons to be learned from it um given that we're turning 42 you know, it's an age where we cannot say, you know, it's an age of maturity. So we have to, you know, as individuals exemplify that and as a nation collectively, you know, that will redound. Excellent. And we have Mr. Tommy Descart. And Tommy was supposed to have been one of the best cricketers in St. Lucia, but he has chosen to go <laughs> in a different direction and went the economic way. And he's rendering service that way. Tommy, I don't want to steal your thunder, but tell us about the portfolio that you know you, you carry and um, your wish for St. Lucia post-COVID-19. Right. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, and I would like to wish uh, St. Lucia a happy 42nd anniversary of independence and also um, my pan the colleague panelists here on this, this panel discussion here today. Um, so I'm the Chief Economist in the Department of Economic Development, Transport and Civil Aviation. And um, my mandate is not as broad as my, my two colleagues here. I just have a narrow mandate in terms of being the, the chief technical lead on national development policy issues in terms of our national development planning framework for St. Lucia. Um, also the public sector investment program and also assist in terms of donor coordination, um, you know, um, across, the, across the, the landscape in terms of development finance. I have a team of about 12 economists, two deputy chief economists, and other economists that I, I supervised. I report directly to my opponent secretary um, 
on all matters pertaining to the Department of Economic Development. And we work very close with the Department of Finance on virtually almost everything that we do. Mm -hmm. So my one wish for, for St. Lucia, I, I think, um, along the same lines with PS, is that I see COVID as, as an opportunity. Um, and I see COVID as, a, as one that accelerates a lot of the reforms and the changes that we need to do as a country. And it's a unique window of opportunity that's provided for us to do that. Um, so I also want Senators to be reminded that they have, we are very resilient people yeah. and we will come out of this COVID um, stronger and better. Um, so let's not waste this opportunity, but seek, seek, seek the, the, the unique uh, opportunities that, that, that COVID presents for us. Excellent, excellent. And we have our two participants and they will be as active as our in-studio participants. Uh, let me call on um, Mr. Allen, Jonathan Allen who is the Commerce and Industry Officer. Tell us more about um, his portfolio and his wish for solution. Uh, good day to, to all um, my colleague panelists. Um, happy independence to all solutions. Um, well, as introduced, my name is Jonathan Ale. I'm from the Ministry of Commerce, International Trade, Investment, Enterprise Development and Consumer Affairs. I'm a consumer an industry officer, commerce and industry officer, sorry, and I am responsible for the food and beverage sector and paper products. Um, it is indeed um, a privilege to be part of this, um, this panel discussion today. Um, as you know, the Ministry of Commerce is the lead on um, commercial activities in St. Lucia, both, set, both setting the, the policy and providing the technical assistance needed for the sector to grow and to develop. Um, my wish for um, St. Lucia for this independence is that um, we would continue to work together as a people. Um, we would set our focus on you know, achieving that, that development that, that we want to see for our country and um, as coming from the Ministry of Commerce, you know, I'd like to see our people more um, patriotic in supporting what is ours, our small business persons, our manufacturers, our service providers. You know, I want to see that um, as time goes by, when people go out to the supermarkets and to the various establishments, that they would look to select what is local before they look at what is important. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Let us now turn to, I like calling him Manny for the money, Mr. Vincent Bolin. And I, I don't know if he needs a special introduction or any mm -hmm. other introduction, but he is the managing director for the St. Lucia Development Bank. And the um, Development Bank is playing a very strategic role in our economic recovery at this time. So, Mr. Bolin, tell us a little bit about, more about your portfolio and your wish for St. Lucia. Thank you very much, Glenn. And good afternoon to everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, you know, happy independence to all, all St. Lucians. I'm extremely pleased to be a part of this discussion this afternoon. Um, we at the St. Lucia Development Bank, well, our portfolio is um, laid out in the act. So, you know, it guides us as to what we should be doing, what we are doing. Um, we are directly um, assisting in the provision of capital, of financing for persons, as well as technical assistance for the promotion and, of the so socio and economic um, development of St. Lucia. Um, we have been playing an instrumental role in looking and seeing how we can be a part of the business recovery program. We're extremely pleased to be here this afternoon. In terms of the what I what I see for you know this coming out of COVID, post-COVID, and from our independence is that we we as a nation have reached as um, P. S. Benson indicated, you know, a level of maturity. And when someone, if you look at your own personal life and said, okay, I've now turned forty-two years old. Where am I? What am I doing? Well, we would have hoped that at that point, persons have either established their business, persons have either completed their education, 
they've started their family and they've started to own a home and therefore they've begun the, uh, the accumulation or the, the, the creation of wealth for themselves and also for the nation. So this is part of what we're looking to, to achieve. Um, I do you know, believe in looking closely at what others have written, have other countries have adopted to see how, what best we can use in St. Lucia to continue the progress that needs to be made. Um, so you know, I look forward to having a lively discussion this afternoon to see how we can indicate to St. Lucians what good things that each of us have been attempting or uh, you know, implementing and carrying out for the benefit of St. Lucia. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I think I envy the two of you on Zoom because you, no long, you don't have to wear your mask and do the social distancing with us in here. So you look like you have it better than us. But <laughs> we go to our first break. Um, but when we come back, we start the discussion on our sustainable economic development, what steps have we have taken towards it, and how we have built um, and, and, and built up towards a sustainable economic St. Lucia. So we'll be back in a short moment. Um, join us on the other side. Welcome back to our discussion in studio, our live discussion on sustainable economic development. A resilient nation, we can, we will. And we go right into our program and we start off with uh, P.S. Rigobert. P.S., how would you describe sustainable economic development for St. Lucia um, in this COVID-19 reality? Thank you, Ben. So, economic development, um, I guess most of us, if not everyone, would appreciate that it entails the policy intervention or the process by which a government provides an improvement in the well-being or the quality of life of its citizenry, its people, and not just residents, but essentially its people. Um, that's linked to social development, which you would appreciate um, if your social status or um, condition is of a high level, then you can benefit from economic development as it progresses. So these two are intertwined. Um, I just want to make a quick distinction between economic development and economic growth. Oftentimes they are used interchangeably, but they're not quite the same. When you measure growth, you're, re you're really measuring <coughs> the output, the productivity of your country, your economy. And oftentimes a measure or metrics would be um, your GDP. There are many others, but that's the commonly used one um, to measure improvements or um, increase in the output of productivity of your country or your economy. So that's slightly different from economic development, which is very broad. It covers your people, politics, profits, and everything that um, your citizenry would interact with as they go about their daily lives. So um, sustainable economic development is um, an intentional policy direction where a government decides, I will develop my country, I will create avenues for growth, uh, I will improve the well-being of my people, the quality of life. However, I will not do this at the expense of future generations. So it's done in a way that preserves the future well-being um, of future generations, which should be our children and our grandchildren. We are not always going to be here. Other persons will come behind us. 
and there's a song that says, Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. It means whatever we do now must be such that we preserve um, an economy that's strong, that's robust, um, infrastructure that's strong, resilient to both climate change and other um, disasters and shocks, and an economy that facilitates development in business, commerce, industry, agriculture, and the list goes on. So it's a purposeful intervention, a policy, um, direction of a government such that you will de develop your country, um, ensure that your people, are, their basic needs are satisfied and met, there, there are avenues for growth and development, for doing business, for creativity to thrive, but preserving at the same time the same thing for future generations to come. I like that. I like how you've created the, made sure that distinction is very clear, economic growth, because sometimes we just always mention GDP and don't mention the other aspects of it. And so it's balanced development in Correct. a sense. Correct. Um, and so, Tommy, um, how has um, your department been involved in um, recovery efforts in economic um, development? Um, what have you been doing? I know that you've had <laughs> millennium medium-term development strategy implemented and, and the like. And also, P.S., I think also what you were leading to as well is um, what has been developed out there, um, sustainable development goals, that's the global. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and are we aligned to this in any way? Uh, thanks, Glenn. Um, so, well, our department, again, Econ Department of Economic Development, Transport and Civil Aviation, our core mandate is, is really to uh, our development planning, our forward planning in terms of where we want our country to grow. Um, in the next 10, 15 years. And so, to PS's point, uh, uh, the distinction between economic growth and development, um, just want to, to, to bring home the point that um, you can have growth and no development, mm -hmm. but you cannot have development without growth. Okay. So, um, that's a fundamental, so it's, it's very important that uh, we prioritize that we need growth. Explain that a little bit. You could have growth without development, but you cannot have development without growth. Yes, so essentially, growth leads to development. So if you have a system where your economy does not prioritize, ensuring that the wealth that it generates um, goes down and trickles down to, your, to, your, to the ordinary citizens, you don't provide them with the necessary infrastructure in terms of health, education. Yes, um, your, your economy is growing. For example, if you look at resource-rich countries in Sub-Saharan, Africa, and so on. There, there are a lot of, if you look at the growth, they're growing, but that growth is not getting to and tangibly altering the well-being and, and empowering the people yeah. so equitable. So, so, so from our department standpoint, uh, in 2020, we, we launched our medium-term development strategy. And that is a four-year plan that looks at um, developing our country, and we prioritize the quality of the growth that we wanted in order to see the kind of development that we wanted. So we, we coined the, the, the acronym Economic Growth on the Arise, and the first one it was Accelerated Growth. Um, if anyone goes and look at from, from post-immediate past independence, 1980 up until now, every decade um, our GDP is slowing. It's actually declining by about a half. So between eight, 1980 to 1989, we had an average GDP about 7.3%. From 1990 up until 1999, it went down to 3.5%. The 2000s, 1 point something. And God alone knows if, if we don't make some serious changes, what's, what's the post-pandemic growth rate going to look like? Now, at these such low growth rates, you really cannot alter an, an the, the quality of life of your people. You need to double the GDP per capita of your country. In, in, in. So, so we have economic growth on the rise. We're looking at accelerated growth at least with 7%. We're talking about resilient e economic growth, inclusive, sustainable, and equitable growth. So, so our department plays that critical role in, in charting the, the, the strategy for in motion. Then COVID hit two or three weeks after we launched this, this, this yes. thing. So um, what we did, we worked very closely with the Department of Finance in putting together economic recovery and resilience plan, which sort of looks at the, in, the immediate response to COVID and how it's impacting on our society in terms of uh, the need for income supports, giving liquidity support to the banking sector, and also ensuring that persons who are vulnerable do not fall below the poverty line and, and so on. Um, fortunately, though, St. Lucia, we, we, were, we also envisioned a, a world beyond COVID, uh, uh, what, I, what we call the uh, uh, post-pandemic era. 
and we work very closely with the World Economic Forum to develop a country financing roadmap for San Lucia that envisage, because you would appreciate that our medium-term development strategy, when it, when it was d developed, it did not consider a COVID world. So we have these three policy documents that, to a large extent, um, will guide San Lucia's development over the next couple of years. And perhaps you could delve more into it um, um, yeah, over yes. the, during the discussion. Glenn. So, so really, Tommy, you're saying that if you had to give St. Lucia a rating in terms of its planning for economic development, we've been doing very yeah. well. Sure. We, 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 have, I mean, we have a policy document, uh, which is the, the medium-term development strategy, yes. which is our baseline. So at least we, w when we were now looking at the COVID response, we had a baseline from which we could start. And then we said, okay, let's, let's augment and let's have a, food strategy, a second strategy that looks at the COVID response. Um, and then we said that the world, uh, and Glenn, the fact is that the world um, will change drastically post-COVID. You, you've seen uh, the digital economy is taking off, ICT and so on. And St. Lucia needs to realign itself to these changes. <coughs> and so we have a, a country financing pro, um, um, pro, uh, project initiative, roadmap rather, that, that uh, would help St. Lucia take off. And I could perhaps, uh, you know, enunciate a bit more on what that, that, that CFR entails in the discussions. Excellent. If I may add, just before yes, we move away ahead. from... Uh, I do have to come back to you specifically for the ERRP, Economic Recovery and Resilience Plan, but uh, go ahead. Yes, just a quick addition to what Mr. Descartes um, explained. Um, your whole growth um, agenda can be viewed as the fuel you put in your vehicle to get from one point to the next. But if that vehicle does not move, there's no development. Yes. So you need growth to fuel development, but development takes you from point A to point B. Point A being the status quo, point B is where you want to see improvements in the quality of life of your people. There's a fair balance between politics, the economy, social economic status of your people, um, social amenities, and environmental needs because you want to develop without jeopardizing the environment as you go along. So uh, that balance, it's a delicate um, balance that you must achieve when you undertake um, sustainable economic growth. It's a, I like and the analogy. Yes, and I like the analogy of the vehicle and, and unless you move, you really haven't made any progress with it. Correct. <laughs> I like that. So that brings me to health because this is the COVID ministry. <laughs> and this is really, COVID has caused us to have um, a more focused discussion on development. Um, so, Mr. Emil, how has the health sector been weathering this pandemic? And do you see a repositioning of the role of the health sector as it has to play a different sort of role in the economic sustainability of the country? Thank you for that. Um, how have we been faring? Um, COVID has placed tremendous you know, pressure on the health sector um, in all areas. The health care infrastructure, you know, the human resource, both clinical and ancillary. Um, there's been tremendous pressure placed on our health sector, so much so that, you know, we're operating two hospitals. That is the respiratory and OKUH, with almost the same resources that we're, you know, that was in place to operate one. With, you know, well, some, when you say you some operate two, you, St. Jude does not fall under the health directly? St. Jude's, we have general oversight, okay. but they're governed by, you know, a board. The, yes. okay. yeah. So there is tremendous pressure, you know, on the health and the healthcare resource. Um, that being said, you know, we have to, you know, as a country, you know, and as a ministry, you know, continue with that fight. Because as has been mentioned, you know, economic development, you know, speaks to, you know, the well-being of people. Right. And, you know, in, in the face of this pandemic, we have to ensure, you know, that our health and our people, you know, will given priority, you know, in that area as we move on, yes. Mm -hmm. Because right now, I think um, health has been thrust into a level of prominence in terms of even a mm -hmm. ministry and, um, that you cannot think of even anything else without thinking about the health of your people. COVID and the shutdowns are really related to the health, yeah. a yeah. health-related issue. Yeah. And so um, economic sustainability has to encircle as well the health. Yeah. 
of, of the yeah, nation. Yeah. But you spoke to, to reposition as well. Yes. And um, well, even prior to COVID, it was recognized, you know, that there needs to be emphasis placed on, you know, our healthcare sector, you know, to transform it and make it more responsive, you know, to the healthcare needs of St. Lucians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, COVID has actually stalled, you know, the progress, but we're striking the balance between responding to COVID, you know, and continuing with that transition. Um, the government secured some 20 plus million dollars from the World Bank as part of the National Health Strengthening Project. And that was to look at, you know, all the components of healthcare, you know, primary healthcare, to ensure that it is, healthcare is accessible, you know, to all St. Lucians and it's affordable, you know, at that. So the, we're not, the repos, repositioning commence even before COVID, but it is recognized and we're learning lessons, you know, from the COVID experience. So as we move on, you know, to co make that transformation, we have to ensure, you know, that it is su sustainable in a way that, you know, it is sustainable and resilient so that, you know, planning for incidences of that nature, uh, and it is projected that we may have a few more, you know, as we move on in our development. We have to take cognizance of that you know, yes. and ensure that we can withstand, you know, such, you know, tragedies and experiences, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so I will come back to you and speak more of um, that resilience that you speak of in health and in line with a national health insurance, mm -hmm. where I know that the ministry is working actively to try to find a solution to this and implement a national health insurance policy. But um, we will not leave out our um, panelists via Zoom. And Mr. Allen, the Department of Commerce um, which deals with the business sector and is a department um, of government which monitors the impact of COVID-19 on the business um, sector. How can you, um, can you tell us how your ministry has responded to and the interventions that you have implemented to bring relief to this sector? Okay. Um, first of all, when the, the pandemic um, finally hit St. Lucia and we had the, the shutdowns and um, the ministry basically took the initiative to um, consult with the, our private sector, the business community. We met with um, organizations such as the, um, the Chamber of Commerce, the Southern Business Association, Bakers Association, our Small Business Association, St. Lucia Manufacturers Association basically to get an idea of how the the pandemic had affected them and had affected business and to get an understanding of what were some of the, the issues that they were dealing with and how the ministry could assist in those areas and um, after these consultations we came up with a number of initiatives that um, were implemented such as um, the reduction in the cost of push, personal hygiene products for the general public so there were concessions on persons who um, were importing PP, PPE items for um, resale. Also, the the bakers um, were able were able to increase the subsidy on flowers for the on flour for the bakers, where um, previously they had a subsidy of twelve dollars, but it went up to seventeen dollars um, on the cost of flour. The aim really was to ensure that um, a staple like bread would not be affected in price by the, the, the pandemic. Also, we launched, we launched the um, Love St. Lucia campaign, which basically, um, the aim of which is to create a thriving local economy by maximizing the potential of local businesses and increasing their market share in the local domestic um, space. And I know this is something that we will touch some more on as we move along. Um, also, the ministry continued to fill up its support to the business community in providing technical support to businesses, um, its provision of um, concessions. Um, we have our small enterprise development unit, which continue to work with the micro and small businesses towards um, helping them achieve their, their goals and basically giving advice and direction to help to, to, 
to survive this difficult situation that they were going through. Also, um, we worked on expediting our fiscal incentive program. Um, we recognized that um, the manufacturers and service providers, they needed really to be able to, to get concessions done within a quick period of time so that they would be able to get the raw materials that they would need, especially those who produce the essential items. So we worked on the expediting of that fiscal incentive process. Also, um, strengthening of our Article 164 implementation. And for those who know the who don't, who don't know, the Article 164 is uh, um, a regime that seeks to promote industrial development for the provision of tariff protection to manufacturers on specific list of goods. Um, basically, what this regime entails is to help our local manufacturers to be more competitive, price competitive, as, com as opposed to the imports. So the aim was to provide support to them in that area, which was the phase one, and the phase two of the support is where we would have um, support in terms of quality and standards, support with um, improving the export potential, and also funding that they would need in order to improve their businesses. Also for our sister agency, Invest and Lucia, the virtual incubator booth was launched. And right now there, there is currently a competition going on, which is a national pitch competition, which basically seeks to assist persons who have ideas and want to bring it to reality. Also with the St. Lucia Development, um, St. Lucia Bureau of Standards, we've worked with them um, towards um, providing support in terms of new standards, standards um, post-COVID for the spa and, and beauty sector to allow them to, to operate in such a way that um, they would be able to deal with, will, with, with this, COVID, this COVID particular issue and stuff like that. Also with our Export St. Lucia um, agency towards going online and providing an online um, modality for its clients. So the ministry has been very active um, since the, the, um, the pandemic hit St. Lucia and we're working actively with assisting our, our business sector to recover and also to get them to the point where they would be more resilient. So these are some of the things that we've been looking at. Man, Mr. Allen, I was still trying to say that I, I thought you wouldn't stop. You guys have been <laughs> working. I thought the pandemic created a slowdown, but I, I could tell that there was a lot of productivity there. So before we actually go to the break, Mr. Boland, I have two questions coming at you. How has the, the banking sector managed during this pandemic? And what have been some of the significant initiatives that the sector has done to cushion the impact of COVID-19? And can you tell us how SLDB has positioned, has been positioned to assist individuals and the business sector to remain viable? Mr. Boland, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. That's uh, three questions, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I class them as no, two. I mean, when, we, when we look at the banking sector, um, the banking sector has actually been, they, they, almost, they are frontline workers, to be quite honest with you. They have had to face customers, uh, regardless of the situation. We have, you know, had a, a lot of discussion of how we manage our staffing, how we get through this with them, so that they can better serve persons in this period. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we see the long lines outside some of the banks because yeah. of the fact that there is social distancing and all of us have had to implement strict protocol to try and keep the welfare of our staff, you know, a, a, intact. But how, how have they performed? They, the, the banks have initiated a moratorium that the licensed institutions, which are the commercial banks, we are, we are a, a, a development institution that is regulated by the Financial Services Regulatory Authority. So the commercial banks had to go to the ECCB and say, listen, can we provide moratoriums for the customers that are impacted? And instantly they said, yes, let's see how we can support them. In the first instance, they said nine months. But as you know, well, in fact, sorry, they said six months. But as you know, the pandemic has now elongated itself 
and persons are, uh, are still feeling it and the banks are again are being asked to see what they can do. They have now signaled that, listen, we will look to see how we can support persons on an individual basis, but given the regulatory requirements, the and for instance, the accounting rules and standards, we will see that a lot of loans will transition into what we would refer to as a, 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 a more riskier loan. And therefore, it causes them to have to increase the level of provisioning on their loans. Okay. And for persons, you know, to, to break it down, this is uh, uh, almost putting a, a doubtful um, mark next to against a borrower to say this person may not necessarily pay you back within the time frame that was agreed to. Mm -hmm. And we have seen results. Some of the banks have issued their results for their, their year end of, of October and they're not, they're not very, very healthy at all. We've seen two of the major banks showing losses for the period, you know, the last um, 12 months up to October, which would include part of COVID and they're not even through it as yet. So they, they, they have had a significant impact. Austin. Okay, we're having some stuttering. Mr. Boland, I think we lost you for a little while. Very interesting point that you're making in terms of the banks having to cushion so much that they need themselves to be cushioned from this impact. <laughs> So if we right. okay, so we back sorry, we, we back we have you now. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry, I seem to have lost. There's a, a, a heavy cloud passing over that seems yes. to have disrupted my internet. So sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So the banks have had to give that liquidity <laughs> support. SLDB jumped instantly to see what, how we can provide that type of support as well. What we have seen is that we are not the traditional bank in that we have customers deposits that allow us to continue. We had to go back to our lenders and speak to them to see what can be done. We were able to, through the, the DVRP, through the work with the World Bank and the Climate Investment Fund, we were able to repurpose the climate adaptation financing facility. And it's now allowed us to offer what we refer to as the CAF Business Recovery Program. And we have 2.6 million US dollars that have been earmarked to be able to online. To date, we've actually had 112 persons who have made inquiries. We have had applications of 2.5 million dollars. And we have already started to disburse. We have approvals for 1.5 million of that, okay. those funds, and we've disbursed about close to 600,000 dollars already to support persons through this period. Because we do understand the, the impact that this has had, it is across the board, but particularly the lifeblood of our economic system, meaning the small businesses. The small businesses require assistance and they need to know where they can access capital to get through. At the beginning, when we you know, made the announcement, we said persons had to hibernate because a hibernation means bring it down and get through the period. But the period is going on and on and yes. on. And we now need persons to refocus and say, okay, what is it that we can do to be able to change our model and to get things going again? Because everybody has to eat. Everybody has to be able to survive through this. And the bank is making capital available to persons to be able to do so. We're working closely with the chamber because one of the things is that you know, we, we as, as the peer said, we can't waste this pandemic in that all of the businesses now need to look at internally, internally to see how self-sustainable they can become, how they can survive anything that comes up in the you know, future. For instance, I, I looked at our business continuity plan and, you know, it spoke about influenza and viruses, it spoke about bombs and hurricanes and earthquakes and all of these things are potentially, you know, uh, can impact a business and cause you to have to now take decisions of either, like we're doing, working from home, I have my team split into two. One set goes in at one time and then the following week another set goes in just to make sure that we keep people safe and if there's a problem, we can isolate those persons and continue to operate. We have had been in contact with you know, a number of the international agencies from CDB to the, the, the World Bank to EIB and all of them are looking to see how they can provide assistance to the people of St. Lucia through the business recovery program. 
So, you know, we, we are happy to be playing our part. We're seeing that there, there is a need to get to reach out even further to more people. We have now targeted, we've started targeting, even before the announcement came on the news, we were targeting the preschools and saying, listen, come and speak to us. Let's see what we can do to help you. The preschools, you say? Reach, reaching out to a number of, you know, the, the smaller businesses to see how, what support that we can provide to them. We work closely with, you know, our colleagues at Ministry of Commerce, Jonathan, with the you know, small business uh, so, uh, unit to be able to get people to, to start looking at their plan, looking at what they're doing, um, putting it in a format that we as a bank, because you know banks have to operate on uh, a plan. If you come to me and you say, oh, I need a, I need $100,000 to get my business going, and I don't know what you're going to sell, I don't know how you're going to earn your revenue, I don't know what's going to impact you, then it makes it difficult for me to make a decision. All right. And I like what you said. I think you mentioned the, the um, what is it again? The, the, the small the yes. educators? Yeah. Preschool. Yeah, preschoolers. Preschoolers. And I think this week there was um, um, a cry from them in terms of what they're going to do. They really need support. So probably um, as they listen to this program, they'll be able to find a solution that fits um, um, their particular need. But we'll go to a break now. But... Um, when we come back from the break, we will go to an interview with Dr. Oria, Oria King-Snack, and she's the Director of Agricultural Services in the Department of Agriculture. And they speak on the interventions that the Department of Agriculture is making towards sustainable economic development for St. Lucia. And then with PS, I will move to you where we discuss mm -hmm. the Economic Recovery and Resilience Plan, and you tell us a little more about this particular plan. Back in a moment. What's in the food you're eating? Do you really even know? All the chemicals and hormones used to accelerate their growth. All the artificial flavoring, sweeteners and colors too. We consume and we don't spare but thought for the damage that they'll do. No, think about the children. Think about the children. How will we save them? Chemicals and GMOs are not the solution. Use organic and join. Excessive agrochemical use, additives, and genetically modified foods are harmful to health and the environment. Join the good food revolution. Grow, buy, and consume organic. A message from Rice St. Lucia and the Ministry of Sustainable Development with funding from the GEF Small Grants Program, UNDP. The Good Food Revolution. Okay, welcome back. And before we go into the discussion program with our panelists, we did a, we conducted an interview with Dr. Aurea King Snack, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about how agriculture is playing such a, a pivotal role in terms of economic sustainable development. We cannot ignore agriculture, particularly in our solution environment. So let us um, listen to Dr. Um, King Snack on this interview. Well, the ministry um, has been looking at forming a, a resilient and a sustainable agricultural sector even before COVID came about. So there are a lot of things that have been put in place, but we are now just re-emphasizing or reinforcing some of those um, technologies or some of those um, recommendations that we have been putting in place. One of the things that we have given very good pri um, priority is promoting smart climate smart agriculture so we have um, situations where we encourage farmers to um, go into rainwater harvesting um, producing crops that are you know a little more resilient to droughts and extreme weather conditions we have um, in places that we have we are known or is prone to be drier we encourage the use of um, drip line technologies irrigation systems and all of these things so we've been introducing to our farmers you know technology to not just sit back and wait for the, the forces of nature to determine how their production goes so um, we have also encouraged them 
and given a lot of assistance in um, building what we call greenhouses or hoop greenhouses to help facilitate or to have some form of continuity in production because you I'm sure you're aware that sometimes you have you have complaints of things are not in season so you you or it's not sustainable you have you could get tomatoes now but maybe in the next two weeks you cannot get tomatoes so things are these um, technologies that we are trying to introduce so then seasons, we wouldn't have an issue as such when it comes to seasonality for, for products. We've also looked at, um, did an assessment of our imports and because of that we have come up with seven crops that we have imported quite a bit of and we're focusing on those seven crops as a pilot so that we could develop them locally and to see how we could reduce on our import bill. So um, with that project, we have been able to distribute over 77,000 seedlings to farmers um, so that they can be able to produce those, those crops. So we talk about things like melons, there is um, 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 sorry, lettuce, you have cabbage, um, there's cantaloupe, there's pineapple. So there's, there are a range of, of products, seven of them, that are used to help us reduce our import bill and feed ourselves. Um, so in that light we have given support to the farmers in providing the seedlings, in giving them inputs at a reduced cost so that they can maintain um, their, their production. We have also been doing some market promotion. So we've had farmers market. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but there were several farmers market going around. And all of this is in keeping in trying to promote our local prod produce. Um, we don't want persons to depend so much on the imports and again we don't want we want persons to go back to having natural foods as opposed to the processed foods. So we've been doing a lot of promotions. We had some trials on some new variety of um, cantaloupes to see how it would be um, if they, they, the public will be interested and if it is then we will go ahead and, and um, continue producing etc. There have also been the um, opening of the National Agricultural Diagnostic Facility. Um, as you are well aware, with globalization and the population increases, you have a lot of stress being placed on production of agricultural products as well as trade in agricultural products. Now with that comes um, increased risk of pests and diseases coming into and threatening our agricultural sector. So the National Diagnostic Facility comes in at a beautiful time. This, the objective of this is to assist us in diagnosing on a rapid basis, on early basis, any um, possibilities of entrance and establishment of any of those pests and diseases. When they're diagnosed then we're able to act swiftly and mitigates against, you know, detrimental effects on the environment, on the agricultural sector. We're also looking at building a um, livestock station with the objective of having it as a center of excellence, where we look at genetics um, to see which crosses or which breeds are better suited for our environment so that they would be able to produce improve production on farms and productivity and of course sustainability of livelihoods. So these are a few of the things that we are looking at. I mean there are so many things to speak about. There is the, the project where we're trying to improve um, honey production. Um, we're looking at quality and quantity of honey. There is also the project, the project which was launched not too long ago where we built a pack house so that we will be able to pack and prepare our agricultural produce in a, in a more um, with better standards so that we could offer to the local market and possible export markets. So there are a lot of things happening in the agricultural sector with the aim of trying to, to keep us food secure, yes, and also to build our resilience to not only secure our populates but maybe later on look at the export market and see what's the possibilities of putting our products out there in the region and maybe even into the international markets. So there's a lot happening. Wow, agriculture is really, as, as uh, they say, on the move <laughs> and there's a lot that's happening in the industry to really um, assist farmers and I know this is also part of another <coughs> plan, a major plan, as, as Tommy and yourself, P.S. have mentioned that this is part of a strategy 
And so it takes us to the Economic Recovery and Resilience Plan for St. Lucia in COVID, for COVID-19. Um, government has put together um, a plan that will help us quickly recover, <coughs> hopefully, and build that level of resilience. Um, tell us about the aim of this plan, and does it leave anyone behind? Does it focus on reduction in poverty, climate action, quality of education, etc.? Thank you, Glenn. Um, like we would have communicated to the public before, um, government's response to COVID was um, threefold. It was a three um, prong approach. There was the immediate healthcare response, and PSM can speak um, more, more on that. We also had the social stabilization plan, and then more um, recently, a broader based plan called the economic recovery and resilience plan. So that plan um, is very, I would say it's all encompassing. It's built on six principles and just quickly to design policy interventions to minimize the fallout from COVID-19, to drive economic growth through um, expediting of many projects and initiatives that would have been in, in, in train already, um, to minimize the impact on the poor and vulnerable of our society, to accelerate reforms that were already um, conceptualized, but to expedite the, that process, and to minimize um, the fallout through um, potential mortality. So we wanted to ensure that the health system was augmented and strengthened. And the sixth one, to build resilience um, against natural disasters and climate change. So these would be the six principles on which the plan was established. Um, we like the number six. So we developed um, the plan along six <laughs> pillars. Uh, the first pillar, stimulating the economy. And the second, fast-tracking shovel-ready projects. And Tommy, I'm sure, can speak very comfortably on this one. The third, to strengthen social, system, um, social protection systems. The fourth, resilience building in the productive right. sectors. Yeah. And the fifth, yeah, strengthening okay. the health resilience. And finally, disaster risk climate change intervention. So these would be the six pillars on which the plan was developed. Um, the plan cost um, to the tune of uh, maybe half a billion dollars and some of that would be grant funding, some loan and other sources of funding and it was important that the gov government develop that plan early in the game to help minimize um, the fallout from the COVID-19. You would appreciate COVID had a significant blow on our economy um, our revenue is essentially uh, largely um, tourism related. Yes. So with the closure of many borders and um, closure of economies across the world in our source markets, we suffered maybe roughly about a 50% decline in our revenue. Tax revenue is the base of our revenue um, and expenditure for the government. So with that, it was necessary to develop a plan that would help mitigate, uh, not just for individuals, but also businesses, small businesses in the private sector, minimize the fallout from the pandemic. Um, there are many interventions in the plan. You have 32 in all um, along the six pillars, 32 inter interventions. Some target um, relief for taxation, whether it be um, expansion, sorry, an extension of tax filing deadlines, um, concessions for various groups of persons, minibus operators, taxi drivers, um, essential workers within the public service. Um, we had other interventions where um, we expanded the list of our poverty list and persons um, who needed support. And, and it's, it's a long list of interventions, um, 32 in all. We can, if we do have the time, we can dwell yes. on them and expand. But I know you're mindful of the time. Mm -hmm. And as such, that's a yeah. quick synopsis. I of think the there's plan. also, and I'm, I'm looking at some of the current affairs <laughs> issues that have hit us throughout the week. And I'm going to the early childhood educators talk about issues of rent and how they manage it. Is there anything in place? Within there, I think there's some issue of rent that had, had come up. I don't know if Tommy or yourself could, could talk about some of, at least if that's, that's part of it, or if, if not everybody is, is, is affected. Well, we've not had any discussion um, with the Ministry of Education on it. Um, the, I, it was brought to our attention at Economic Development, and, um, and the idea was uh, we were having a discussion at this, the Caribbean Development Bank and the possibility of providing support to them. I know that, Mr. like Mr. Boland would have indicated, um, he too had a keen interest in it. Yes. Um, so it's something that we are, um, I mean, it's a very dynamic situation. And yes. I, I guess PS knows that 
every day a request comes and we have to respond mm -hmm. to it. So because yeah, the ERP so is not meant to be static. Yeah, yes. It's yeah, very yeah, dynamic yes, in its yes, operation. Yes, yes. But only along that same line, um, critical to sustainable economic development is a strong um, social safety net um, dealing with human rights issues and the like. Um, is there a strong socio-economic agenda that is built into the ERP and can you speak to some of those that really affect people directly? I know we talk a lot about business activity. What affects persons in there and persons that directly are impacted? Sure, Glenn. Um, so certainly again, I would like to reiterate the point that COVID is, is a, a sort of an accelerator. So I know that there, um, from the people's perspective, St. Lucia had a strong focus on uh, social protection reform in terms of lifting people out of poverty. Um, as perhaps most persons would know, we have about a 25% poverty rate in St. Lucia. And so in the ERP, we, we saw it was a good opportunity to, to respond to this, this issue by um, expanding the number of persons who are on public assistance by 1,000, um, taking it from 2,600 to 3,600 persons. So you have a significant uh, number of households who are um, who are now getting access to cash transfers would have helped them during what is a very difficult time. Uh, other persons would have gotten support, persons on foster care, um, children who have disabilities and so on. The government would have, as part of the ERP, provided a top up on the cash transfers that they're receiving. And so um, there's also a recognition that um, as this, the, there's a lot of distress on families, Glenn, um, as a result of the COVID. And so the mental health and, and, and yes. um, issues and also um, intimate partner violence and abuse is something that, 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 um, that, that is, is real, a real issue now. And we've gotten support from the UN Women and other agencies to come and help some of these support. Um, so in the main, the, the ERP recognizes the role of um, and, and the importance of ensuring that people are centered in this and the human rights aspect of it. Um, so in, in the main, we think that it, is, it captures everyone, no one is left behind. But uh, it's a dynamic document that is living and as, as needs arise, we, would, we respond mm -hmm. to it as best as possible. And, and as P.S. said, there are 32 interventions. P.S., if, if I, uh, someone is interested in, in, in trying to follow, in trying to see what's available, can they access it in any place? Will it be available soon that persons would be able to follow some probably digitally? Thank you, Glenn. So. Um, in addition to developing the plan, we decided to develop a website where you can access the plan and go through it at your leisure and discretion. Um, so we will be launching this shortly over the next few days and everybody um, can and will be able to access the plan uh, virtually. You go online and access the plan. So we will be launching this and I'm sure you'll be informed of the particulars. Uh, you would be able to see each intervention on the, each of the pillars and you would see the progress we've made on, on each of these. So it would show whether it's ongoing, completed, launched, and you would have that status update um, ongoing and at your, disc um, the, um, your discretion you can access the plan. Just to highlight a few of the things we've uh, launched, um, we have launched the electricity assistance program that really benefits thousands of solutions and it's aimed to provide relief um, in terms of the expenditure, the monthly expenditures. So you would be able to get a credit against your electricity bill if you qualify for that measure. Um, we have a, one of the interventions would be to incentivize the banking sector if they online to small businesses, small and micro enterprises. Um, we also have, there's the provision of water tanks, which is part of mm -hmm. the resilience building um, to equip persons and institutions with the capacity to store clean water in the event of a natural disaster. So that's all part of our resilience building um, initiatives. There are quite a number. So once we've launched the website, I'm sure you can <laughs> access it and benefit from the information that's there. Because it also serves as a monitoring uh, mechanism as well for both the public and also stakeholders yeah. involved in it. Yes. Um, yeah. While um, I'm on the plan and the website, I need to register our appreciation to the many persons who helped with that plan. We did establish a multi-sectoral committee um, with membership from a wide cross-section of public and private sector agencies, the banking sector, the legal fraternity, accountants, and 
all the ministries, and that was spearheaded by the Department of Finance and the Department of Economic Development. We worked for three to four months um, uh, very um, feverishly to develop the plan, and I, we do appreciate the efforts of the private sector in particular. Um, they did contribute significantly to that plan, and it's really been um, used as a tool to help the country rebound from the COVID pan pandemic. Okay. So and then one added, just as added benefit of the plan is that when you now engage uh, your donor community, um, they're saying, well, uh, one of the things they, they commend in Senator for is that you have a plan. Yes. And so they can align their areas of support to the plan. And, and so it's, it's a very um, good, good instrument for us in terms of responding to COVID. Yeah, because it shows that, you know, we have a focus in terms yeah. of how we yeah. aim to push our level of development. In line with this, um, Mr. Um, Emil, Health insurance has been something that has been talked about for a while. And where are we at with a national health insurance? Um, thank you again for that. Um, well, we started some time ago, discussion was around, um, the discussion was around universal health care. And now we have moved to national health insurance. And there's a, a clear distinction between the two in that um, universal health care would make you know, healthcare accessible at our public facilities and um, supported and financed, you know, by tax provisions. Um, for national health insurance, on the other hand, it is ensuring that or uh, putting things in place for all solutions to be covered with health insurance. Um, it is recognized, well, that a very small percentage of solutions already have health insurance and um, the government felt it necessary to intervene and introduce an essential health service, services package, which is a basic, basic health care coverage that every solution should at least have. Um, going forward, what would happen is that the, 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 the insurance itself, persons would be encouraged, you know, to, to, to sign up to health insurance, but those who cannot afford, the poor, the indigent, the unemployed, government will be expected to cover them with a, a, an insurance package. Um, it is a more targeted approach, you know, at reaching out, you know, to those, the poor and the indigent, as opposed to subsidizing it across the board where, you know, persons who can't afford benefit, for the, benefit from the subsidy at the cost of the government. Um, where we are with it, well, we have developed and gotten the, the, the model itself approved. Um, we have, we're in the process now, you know, establishing, you know, the infrastructure that allow for its rollout. Um, we have developed, or we're in the process of developing the strategy for enrollment. We have sent requests for proposals to our insurance companies you know, to, pr to present us, you know, with their proposals for the, the area that government is expected to cover. Um, we're also to looking at, you know, the legislative requirements and the le legislative change requirements, you know, that has been considered strongly now. And, you know, the, the IT infrastructure, you know, that would drive, you know, the, the relationships between the provider, the insurance company, you know, and the client you know, seeking care. It is expected that, you know, when it is truly rolled out and we're anticipating, you know, by August to, 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 to commence the rollout, it's expected that, you know, when it, when it is fully rolled out, you know, that every solution will have access to at least basic health care package, you know, that covers um, their primary health care needs and a large component of their, their secondary health care needs. Um, the emphasis for this phase of the essential health services package looks at primary health care, you know, to a large extent because of, you know, the high incidences of non-communicable diseases, you know, that we face in St. Lucia. And for us as a country to be productive, you know, every time, every minute lost, you know, as a result, yes. you know, a person's being of ill health is productive hours lost. And for us to develop and to be sustainable in our development, we have to address, you know, the issues of healthcare. 
by way of treating persons with those conditions and also promoting, you know, those preventative measures, you know, that would reduce you know, those incidences. Okay. Uh, you mentioned something there that um, we really need to, to, to focus on as well. Um, and I really want Jonathan to address it, but we, we will go to a break before we get to Jonathan and Mr. Boland. And it's really talking about the digital economy and how this will assist us as well in a sustainable economic um, development path that we, we, we must go on. And I think all of us have been thrusted into that digital economy through teleworking, through having to do services, a lot of services remotely because we cannot do it in person and there's a lot of activity going on there. Um, we also spoke with Mr. Marlon Nassis and we will bring an interview um, with him. Um, he is the Director of Public Sector Modernization who speaks of the Digicov project and how government is, has, is pushing 154 services. They've launched 17 so far to ensure that we could continue um, in the absence of being able to be physically in the same space, we could do a lot of activities remotely and help boost productivity within the country and push the economy forward. So we take our uh, break right now and we'll come back with an interview with Mr. Nassis and also we have some questions for Mr. Boland and Mr. Allen. Back in a moment. Do you know we can limit the spread of the COVID-19 virus? The Ministry of Health is your partner in achieving this solution. Introducing the Amber Wristwatch. The Amber Wristwatch is designed for monitoring daily movements while in quarantine. It provides an accurate location and a precise heart rate. The device is also waterproof and can be worn during all daily functions like washing the dishes or taking a shower. It's worn like a typical timepiece. The Ministry of Health can now better monitor people in home quarantine and receive alerts of those who do not stay in the confines of their home. A 14-day rental of the Amber wristwatch is just 75 US dollars. Let us stop the breaches of home quarantine. Welcome back. We're discussing sustainable economic development. And we have our panelists in studio and we have those on Zoom. And we will be speaking with Mr. Jonathan Allen in a short while. But we have an interview with Mr. Marlon Nassis. And he is the Director of Public Sector Modernization in the Department of the Public Service. And he speaks specifically about the digital economy and government's thrust at the moment to ensure that um, we go digital and we benefit from all the advantages of going digital. So let's have this interview with Mr. Nassis. And then Mr. Allen, we will come to right to you. Um, ICT will form and right has on. formed the, the basis for um, how government has uh, he's about uh, responded to the COVID. I can't even bring another clip that um, I have with For him, our though. sustainable development, um, looking at the future state of St. Lucia, as we're doing now through the development of our national ICT policy and sectoral alignment strategy, ICT is uh, playing a pivotal role. Um, and the DigiGov platform, coincidentally, which we launched um, in June of 2020, um, allows us to put in motion that specific, um, those specific features um, of, of exactly how technology can play a role um, in our sustainable development and how we respond to COVID-19. Um, so the DigiGov platform was designed to enhance the provision of public service delivery um, whilst maximizing the efficiencies of government data assets. Um, through the integration of government operations, the ICT infrastructure and services. Um, DigiGov forms part of that larger strategic ICT development, as I mentioned. Um, and the national ICT policy and sectoral alignment strategy will put in motion that vision for digital transformation of not only the government of St. Lucia, but St. Lucia um, as a country. Um, we, we're looking at several um, areas of integration and alignment throughout the economic pillars <coughs> of St. Lucia. Um, so we look areas like tourism, how can tourism leverage ICT, digital tourism as we say, um, to bring people to our shores, but to also give them a pre, um, a precursor of what it would be like to be in St. Lucia, what type of ICT um, 
experiences can be had on island. Um, with, with agriculture, um, we're looking to implement um, technologies like Lero One technologies, where we can uh, um, explore the possibility of, of providing real-time information on crops, the status of the soil, um, even looking at um, flood mitigation efforts through that technology. Um, <clears throat> even circumstances within the, the education sector, you know, I've had several discussions with my colleagues just looking at how this, the education sector can respond. And um, as part of our digital transformation strategy and um, project, um, which was approved last year in um, November, um, we're looking at providing additional sets of um, um, portable equipment, mobile devices to the students, um, laptops to the students, but also as part of that larger um, policy to enhance the education system, how do we now leverage those platforms that are already in existence, like our government wide area network, to support that distributed learning for the education system? Um, and we could go on and on and on with Ministry of Health as well, the health, the health sector where um, we've provided some support. Um, our office is directly involved in um, preparing that digital certificate for persons once they've gotten their vaccine. Um, <clears throat> and also just to enhance the capabilities of the ministry to be able to be more responsive um, using technology um, as we, we go through this cycle um, responding to COVID-19. The DigiGov platform, we currently have 17 services on the platform. They are all currently driver's license related. Um, but we've been getting a lot of calls um, from the public um, questioning or um, asking when are we going to get the vehicle services online. We, have, we are almost through with the development. We have to now go for the, the, the user acceptance testing, which is scheduled for next week. Um, and then further to that, we will then do some additional real world type of scenarios before those systems become available. So I would say um, within the next two months, those vehicle related services will become online. And I think that would help alleviate a lot of the pressures that is being faced now with the ministry, especially the um, uncertainty that exists where today the office is open, tomorrow is closed because of a COVID case. And so um, <clears throat> we see the DigiGov platform as playing a pivotal role in government's response. Um, we're also looking at um, providing services like um, applications for birth certificates, applications for death certificates. And the other large component of this project, which we will see within the next four to six months, is the implementation of several of the um, business registry services um, to help support some of the, the, business, the, the transactions of our business community. Um, but to add to that as well, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're currently finalizing our national ICT policy and sectoral strategy for the next five years. And as part of that digital strategy, we're looking at how we could align our ICT plans with some of the larger socioeconomic plans that the government has had and approved over the last year or so. So um, we reviewed the midterm development strategy, for example. We've re, we've, we're aligning our, our, our ICT strategy with the competitiveness agenda. And so <clears throat> as part of that process, we've had some consultation workshops um, and we're now completing that alignment that we spoke of where our ICT plans can fit directly into a strategy that we know that the government is, 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 is um, involved in and, and actually has approved for funding for the next couple of years. So um, we think that is a winning, winning strategy um, as we move along. Um, and um, I'm hoping that uh, once we have that document completed in the next um, six weeks, um, we will then move into a quick implementation because um, the government also approved the um, Caribbean Digital Transformation Strategy, where St. Lucia has taken a loan for 20 million US dollars to fund a lot of these ICT initiatives. <clears throat> and one of the major components of that, which focuses directly on sustainability of these ICT initiatives, is the legal and regulatory framework that needs to be put in place. So we're focusing on consolidating government's data assets. So again, to be more responsive to, stra to, to um, tragedy, hurricanes, earthquakes, um, by consolidating those data assets. We're also putting in the legislative framework to support cloud computing and these, these types of, um, of, of activities. And as well, um, the other major aspect of that is the, the establishment of the critical cohort of, of professionals to provide, um, to develop a, 
um, search response team. Because as you know, by putting more and more of our services online, we need to now have the capacity to deal with incidents where there is com computer crimes, etc. So um, we see this current digital transformation ag agenda has been very, very positive. And um, over the next couple of months, the solution public will see more and more of these services um, come online um, as we go on. So I'd just like to encourage the public to, to go and sign up on our DigiGov platform. It's www.digigov.govt.lc. Well, I think the PS, um, um, Esther Rigobert mentioned that, you know, this is like a, a vehicle development. If the vehicle stays steady, you're not developing. And really, this DigiGov platform is really being pushed and you're moving quite a bit. And there's a lot of activity happening there. Um, Mr. Allen, Jonathan Allen, I want to bring you in because the business community, how does it view uh, the digital economy and the opportunities there for economic development? Okay, thank you. Um, I want to say that um, in terms of the business community, especially this, the, the, the small business community, um, they actually find that, um, that our development as a country in terms of ICT has been very slow because um, for a number of years um, clients have had um, a number of online businesses, online services, um, online platforms that they weren't able to, to use because we were just not ready at the time for that type of technology. Um, what COVID has done is basically it has um, opened the way for a lot of these digital businesses to, to, to come out and to start being profitable. So we see a lot of um, online businesses offering um, um, shopping services. Um, um, we have persons who have a, a digital wallet, for example, Penny Pinch. Um, so the business community is ready to go with the digital technology, but I think that um, we as a, a government needs to work um, faster and better towards putting the, the legislations in place and the, the policies in place in order to govern this, this um, digital um, world that we're living in right now. Um, we have a number of um, businesses who um, right now they, they, they offer um, digital business places where anyone who has um, products or service, services who do not have an online presence could come on to, to, to offer these services or these products and um, be able to take in payments online. So I think now is the, the, the opportune time for um, that thrust towards the, the digital economy because the, the business persons, especially the young, small business persons, they are ready to take advantage of it. Okay. Thanks for that because um, I think digital services has been... Uh, we had a discussion during the COVID, uh, earlier in the, the COVID pandemic, talking about the digital economy and opportunities, uh, you know, um, so many opportunities are, are available to businesses if they move in the direction of embracing the digital economy. And one of those agencies is the banking sector. Um, you have Mr. Bolan, you have um, the digital EC currency. And I really want you to tell me how that will assist business. I think we've had from the ECCB up to this weekend, I think the first successful transaction with um, the digital EC dollar in Grenada. And they're hoping that this year, there'll be a bigger rollout of services. Um, but in line with that, Mr. Boland, access to finance has been um, cited as a major constraint for many businesses. And the government will still introduce two pieces of legislation, it's namely the bankruptcy and insolvency bill and the security interest in movable assets bill um, to create greater access to finance for small and micro businesses. How does your banking sector see this? And um, how do they see the introduction as well of the digital EC dollar? Thank you, thank you, Glenn. So, I mean, any, any new product to facilitate the flow of funds between 
you know, the purchaser and the, the, the seller will make it essential um, to, to transact business. What we have seen in COVID, you know, the impact of COVID is that all businesses at one point had to, you know, rely on their online presence. I mean, we as a bank, as we are rolling out the business recovery program, we have indicated to persons to go online and see where you can access you know, the information that we have. On there, you will be able to see that you need to pr provide a business plan to us to be able to come um, email it to mybank at sldb.lc so that we now can utilize that same sort of um, digital option to be able to transact business. The two pieces of legislation is something that you know a number of parties have been crying out for a long time to see how best we can facilitate the, the freeing up of capital. You have the banks in particular have always been impacted by the ability to recover their funds if there's a when if and when there's a problem. So by introducing this legislation, you will find that now the, the banks can have a registry that um, allows for you know easier access allows persons to, to, to know if there's a bill of sale in place on a vehicle or equipment so that another lender doesn't come along and, and, and put the same um, structure in place on that same equipment. So these things I think, yes, we will see um, a free number of capital. When we look at the, the bank, the, the bankruptcy legislation, well, and insolvency legislation, these, these, this particular bill um, it has, you know, it, it can be looked at from both angles. In that, yes, some people will be fearful of it, it causing them to lose their house or causing them to be, you know, in a situation where the bank is coming after them. But it protects them in that you can now take in front and come to the bank and say, listen, I have a problem and this is how I intend to solve it. And you can lay out what your remedy is so that you can approach all of your creditors and say, listen, I want to have an arrangement to settle you and you and you over a period of time. And this is how we see you know, uh, our um, institutions being strengthened by persons having the ability to provide that type of feedback. I mean, at the bank, we are seeing the need to work with persons in that, in that sphere in terms of digital technology. We have been able to assist you know, in, in looking at persons transitioning part of what we're doing in, in the brp is providing capital providing assistance for persons to transition so, to the digital economy so when you come with your business plan and your proposal and you say that listen so i, I now Tony. need to move, move my restaurant online um and to be able to have pickup services delivery services where people can access that it becomes you know something that we are attracted to to say yes we can understand so that's how the business um, model will now move there are areas that you know we still need to talk about as we go forward, but um, I think that these things will allow for a greater flow of capital. One of the things that we have recognized is that you know unless persons can access capital, it, 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 we, we're not going to see the growth that we're looking for. And also we have to look and see how does it become sustainable. So these are the areas that we think that you know persons must be attracted to, they must be moving to. The SLDB stands prepared to assist persons in, in, in accessing the capital that they need. Um, the fact that now banks can you know see how they can recover, that was one of the key areas that was causing a, a decline in our ease of doing business. In that persons, investors found it difficult to be able to recover their funds um once it has been disbursed and if there's a, any change or there's a problem they, it's taking you know seven ten years to be able to recover on an asset if you have to go through our existing process we're hoping that the new legislation will make it easier for persons to be able to recover and also allow persons not to just stay in that sort of doldrum of not being able you know being stigmatized as having bad credit because this allows you to work your way back up and to be able to get out of that scenario when these, these new bills are introduced. So I'm happy to hear that the banks are willing to do this because this legislation, I think, is part of, of our economic recovery and resilience plan in terms of the legislation reform necessary to have greater access to finance. And um, it will be on stream, hopefully, um, very soon. Um, Tommy, in terms of um, 
the IMF. The IMF has been projecting that tourism will not be back, not until probably 2024. Um, can St. Lucia survive that long? And what are some of the projects in place? What have been happening? And P.S. you could chime in at any point during this. Thanks, Glenn. I, I think that's a, that's a million dollar question. I mean, St. Lucia is uh, very tourism independent. Um, as a matter of fact, a recent study uh, um, suggested that we are the sixth most tourism dependent, dependent country yes. in the world. Um, which accounts for almost 40% of our GDP, uh, upwards of 25% of um, em employment. So certainly a world where tourism is not um, what it was pre-COVID is certainly going to put a significant strain on our, on our, on our economy and, and so on. And the question of whether we can survive, uh, we will have to survive. And that's, there's, no, there's no two ways about it. We'll have to survive as a country. I think what has to happen is perhaps internally look at the tourism product and for example Barbados has done the passport, the welcome stamp passport and recently they indicate that it's working quite well. Persons now with the digital nomads, persons who want to just go to a country for six or eight months uh, get access, you know, so we can look at that. Um, I, I, I'm not sure as to how the Ministry of Tourism is approaching that. Um, in the interim, what the government has done <coughs> and part of the Economic Recovery and Resilience Plan is uh, try to stimulate the economy um, over the medium term through capital projects. Glenn. I see a lot of road projects going on. Is that part of what you're talking about? Yes, yeah, yeah, so the road projects, and, and we're happy to, to report that the, the UK SIF, the, the, the uh, uh, Million Highway to Sufre project, that is, 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 is on stream, and, and we anticipate that um, it, that will inject significant capital into our, into our economy, which will provide jobs and income and sort of stimulate some sort of economic activity um, in the interim. So we also know that the HIE project is, a, is another project. And, and I must say that even the IMF themselves have indicated that um, we cannot sit idly by and wait for COVID to, to disappear. As a country, and, and, and they are saying, you need to invest in infrastructure, but infrastructure that will repay itself in the future and so your roads and your airports um, if you expand your airport um, and you're, you're now bringing in more persons in the potential is that it would be able to pay off in the in the long run um, some of these loans are very concessional um, Glenn you understand um, the UK SIF in particular is, is a grant to a large extent from the UK government um, and so uh, Department of Economic Development is, 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 is keen in that area we see that if that's the only way we can really survive um, in terms of this very, very difficult period. Um, uh, we also recognize that there, there must be a thrust towards diversifying our economy. So again, the um, country financing roadmap now looks at how do we go into um, the green economy? How do we go into the blue economy? And, and, um, and so these critical areas, the digital economy, like, like Jonathan and, and Marlon indicated, is critical. If they talk of the circular economy with yes. um, solid waste management, solid waste management like. and so on. And so there are a number of, and, and I, I just would like to really indicate that what we did with the World Economic Forum was that uh, there's a lot of global funds out there, Glenn, in the, in, the, you know, in the international community. How do we get these individuals to come here in St. Lucia and to invest? One of the things they've said repeatedly is, oh, we have a too small of a market. So they're not going to get the return on their investment and so on. And so what, what the World Economic Forum did for us was that brought us closer to these development partners, the World Bank, the IMF, and even on the private sector side, and say, hey, this is the reality that St. Lucia is, is, is facing. Um, how can you perhaps come and support us in, in moving the issues on, on the, the, the blue economy um, the, the, and, and the, the digital economy and so on? So, so we do see that, um, I mean, the reality is that tourism has taken a hit. Um, but we need to be innovative and, and so if you go di digital economy, you have access to a global market as opposed to a narrow uh, 183,000 uh, persons and so on. So, so um, I do know that uh, we're hoping for the best, Glenn, that the vaccines can be rolled out rather quickly and persons' confidence in the travel and tourism sector can, can come up as quickly as possible. So we need to really wrap up time. So P.S., I'm going to ask you to just dovetail on what Tommy has indicated because it really falls on your ministry to implement a lot of those. So any other thing that um, we have indicated in terms of our su economic sustainability that you want to um, be able to highlight? Thank you, Glenn. So just to add to what Mr. Mr. Descartes articulated, um, we have been in engagements with the IMF, the World Bank, CDB, ECCB for the last 12 months, I mean, since the pandemic. 
um, in a very targeted approach. And we would have accessed concessional funding from most of these, the IMF, the World Bank in train, um, ECCP, as well as CDB. And as was mentioned earlier, when you have a plan, a strategy, then you know, donor agencies come ready to your rescue because they see you have a vision, you know what you're about, you, um, and you're ready to go. So we have access to um, a few loans. Some persons have expressed concerns about whether we can sustain those borrowings. I just need to um, indicate here that these are sustainable for a number of reasons. We have very concessional terms on all of these, and we have a long moratorium to a long period of time can span from 20, 30, even 40 years over which we will be repaying those loans. And we had to go this route for a number of reasons because the donor community was ready. They saw um, potential and possibilities um, within our jurisdiction. And they also saw that we would be able to come back after the crisis a bit. So um, just to clear the affairs in terms of the um, borrowings that have um, been done over the last 12 months. And most of them are aligned with the economic and recovery resilience plan. Yes. Just quickly, um, diversification, like a lot of persons often allude to, is not a replacement for tourism. It's really to find opportunities to anchor tourism, to have linkages between tourism, which is still our main economic driver, and other sectors, agriculture, agro-processing, um, technology, ICT, um, um, as Mr. Marlon articulated earlier. So it's really to form linkages and to bring about greater synergy between all of these sectors. Um, debt sustain sustainability is something I wanted to touch on briefly. Um, we may not have the time to explore it, but that's an important part in yes, having sustainable, yes. sustainable economic growth to maintain your debt levels and to manage your fiscal space and to allow for space for growth because we have capacity to grow a lot more um, in terms of the productive sectors, the private sector, a lot of creativity is out there and we need to harness these and really bring about greater economic growth. There's so much to discuss in this mm -hmm. particular topic and probably it's good to have probably a second, a second discussion because we feel like we're running a marathon to get all the points <laughs> in. Um, last point from you and um, Mr. Emil, just vaccination. Do you see this as a game changer? for sustainability currently in this COVID-19 reality? Um, well, yes, it has been, you know, Tommy mentioned it earlier, you know, there's a ray of hope, you know, with the vaccines and vaccinations. And we are very optimistic about it, but we have to also be very cautious, you know, in our approach because, you know, what the science is dictating is that, um, you know, the vaccine, it is not proven, that, you know, that the vaccine will, you know, slow a bit tr transmission. But what it does, you know, it reduces, you know, the level of complexities that will come across, you know, medical complexities that is that will come across if you, you know, are to attract COVID. Um, so certainly when the vaccines are rolled out and we're working feverishly to secure, you know, St. Lucia's provision, when that is rolled out, it would allow for, you know, a little more opening of the, 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 our local economy yes. and the world economy by extent. And given our heavy dependence on tourism, you know, we expect, you know, to see some degree of return, you know, be it progressive. Um, so certainly the vaccine is a, 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 a change. It would game be a, ch a game changer. Yes. But as well, we have to come to the recognition you know that COVID will be around for a while, That's correct. and uh, then we'll, we'll have to live with, you know, maintaining the protocols that are established, you know, for us securing, you know, reducing, you know, the risk associated with COVID. Well, I'll tell you, yes. I can't wait to have a normal <laughs> discussion without a mask on my face, <laughs> and um, to not social distance and have bring a, bring back a number of the activities that we've yes. missed so much because I think. As I said, from the time I was in secondary school, man is gregarious by nature, and we need each other. We need that level of companionship. Um, our two Zoom um, participants, I am so sorry I will not be able to come to you at this time. I think um, what you said before was actually your ending statement because we have another program. This is live, and we have another program commencing at 4. Um, I thank you for your participation, and I thank you for this discussion. And as you realize, sustainable economic development is really a broad topic, and it is one that cannot just take a two-hour discussion and probably have to segment it. And so it's an opportunity now to look at different areas mm -hmm. and be able to now bring it out to the public in terms of how St. Lucia has been doing in that light. 
Let me thank everyone for being part of this discussion. We've been discussing sustainable economic development and in line with our 42nd anniversary of independence. Have a wonderful independence, everyone, and keep safe, follow the protocols, and enjoy yourself in by social distancing as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Oh